Welcome to Mining Over Canada. I'm your host, Barrington Miller, from the Canadian Securities Exchange. And today I am doing a special interview. Special because I'm not interviewing a listed company. I'm not interviewing solely a service provider. I'm interviewing a community along with a service provider. Um, you know what? Just stick around and watch and I'll, uh, I'll let you figure it out. Welcome to Mining Over Canada. Join the Canadian Securities Exchange and our partners in a first-hand look into our country's vast mining landscape. Okay, let's go around and do some introductions. We have MNP. Go ahead, Marcel. Tell us who you are and what you do. Hi, my name is Marcel Gagno. I'm a partner here at MNP in Thunder Bay. Um, and I am what they call the recipient appointed advisor for the community of Cat Lake First Nation. Thank you. Uh, Terrell. Hi there, I'm Terrell Lahoy, uh, partner in the Winnipeg office. I do some work with Rainy River First Nation, more on the advisory side. Thank you. Chief Russell Wesley. Yep, as, uh, my, my name is Russell Wesley. I'm the chief of Cat Lake First Nation and, uh, and I, I bring a little bit of uh, experience in mining. And last but not least, Sonny, CEO, tell us. <clears throat> yeah, my name is Sonny McGinnis. I'm the CEO of our uh, Ag Dev Corporation at Rainy River First Nation. The name of our corp is uh, ZB Anishinaabe basically translates to uh, river people amongst, uh, uh, in our language, in our culture. Greetings. Uh, greetings and uh, thank you all for, for being here. Now, we're doing, if you're watching or listening, if this is your first time tuning in, we are doing a project called Mining Over Canada. And what that means is that we are celebrating the companies that are listed on our exchange in a sector that has been what we think of as fundamental uh, in the Canadian economy. In doing so, we don't want to just talk about the companies. We want to talk about uh, the people and we want to talk about communities and everything that encompasses it. And so when it comes to Indigenous groups, I know I, for one, have either everything I've learned has either been from a, from a newspaper or, or a history book or, or something along those lines. And I'm really, really fortunate and blessed right now to have the opportunity to speak to somebody um, who has been involved with the mining sector. So uh, Chief, I'm going to ask you, um, how has your relationship been with mining? Not only for you, but also um, also your your group i can give you a long story if you want i, I got uh, time i got you, time. <laughs> well uh cat, cat lake has a long history with mining uh starting with the uh with uh, uh the donna lake mine and then the golden patricia mine which was uh nearby in in our lake and then we moved on to uh uh, what would be the uh, the muscle white mine? Each one, each each of these uh, mines were uh, had uh, uh, different, uh, uh, let's say, experiences. Uh, earlier on, uh, uh, prior to Placer Dome Canada and uh, Jay Taylor, who was the president at the time, prior to that, uh, mining was uh, a relationship between uh, government, industry, and uh, uh, and uh, the First Nations, meaning the federal government, Ontario government, uh, the mining company, and the First Nation. Um, we uh, the problem with uh, with with that was uh, we we never had any uh, policy input or any uh, impact on uh, on uh, uh, the mining uh, uh, regulatory bodies or their policies. Uh, the Mining Act, we didn't have any of that. So, so. Uh, <clears throat> One of the things that we fought for through our tribal council, the Legal First Nations Council, was uh, the, the ability to be able to plan for our, our lands, our traditional lands. So 
that's where the land use planning initiative started. Then, uh, and prior to uh, a certain point in years, uh, we Cat Lake had a, a land use plan jointly with uh, North Caribou Lake First Nation it's called Pimage and Sustained by the Land. So what we wanted to do there was we wanted to control development, not control development or, or not oppose it or anything like that, but to have an input into how uh, we were benefiting from our land. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have the uh, the uh, uh, the ability to. We didn't have the legislative piece that would uh, allow us to enforce our land use plan. Uh, and eventually, uh, government walked away from the table, uh, citing uh, a lot of responsibility within the responsibility of industry. So we lost that. Um, Plaster Dome was a game changer. They, uh, uh, this, there was a guy there that uh, wanted to, to make changes and, and, and he, ultimately he did because uh, uh, Plaster Dome was the first, uh, as far as I know, the first mining company that had a revenue sharing agreement with the First Nation and it was Catholic and North Caribou and subsequently uh, uh, Kingfisher and Wanaman and two tribal councils. So it was the first, and as you know, today, revenue sharing is a norm. And if it wasn't for this Jay Taylor, um, we would have, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today because he had enough forward visioning to, to be able to accommodate a lot of the, uh, uh, the treaty regulated changes that were coming down the pipe, pike in the area of uh, 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 the duty to consult and all of those fun stuff. So he helped trigger all of that. And then all the case law that came and put us into a place where the environment is now different. Uh, I, I say that uh, revenue sharing is a norm and uh, we, we do get the benefit of, a lot of benefit of the, uh, the revenue sharing component. Um, I'm, so don't mind back. me, I just yep. wanna interrupt a little bit because some of our listeners won't know or understand what revenue sharing means or how it works? Well, there's different uh, different types uh, in, in, uh, in the case of the Muscle White Mine and, uh, and uh, Gold Corp or Newmont, I believe it is now. It's just a, a dollar amount that's taken right off the price of gold, the ounce of gold. And I'm just gonna throw out an arbitrary number, something like $7 uh, per, uh, per, you know, Per, per ounce of gold, so that's what it is. But those 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 form those revenue sharing models are continually changing as uh, as different First Nations are coming up with their own variations of revenue sharing models. But I'm just describing what was the first one was like. Yeah, I'm involved in a new mine. I'm, uh, I have a mining company that's been knocking on my door for some time. Uh, a new revenue sharing model may come out of this one, totally different. We, you never know. They're, they're always evolving with the, with the times. So, but there is some substantial benefit that come out of these for, the, for, for my First Nation. And um, um, the only problem is in, in the general opportunities section, like the business development side, there's uh, clauses in these mining agreements that have, uh, that have to do with employment numbers. And uh, we, we thought we were being conservative at the time. Well, I mean, uh, we thought we could achieve the, the, the percentage that we identified, 25% uh, Aboriginal employment um, is normally what we, we, we would put in there. So, so it does generate a, a lot of Aboriginal employment, like in the Musquite Mine, like our, our tribal council uh, generated a lot of businesses out of, uh, out of that. And in my community actually during, uh, uh, when construction started on the mine, we we generated approximately twenty one million dollars, I believe it was, in uh, in uh, uh, business uh, generated uh, monies. It's a substantial amount, amount, but uh, um, on that side of things, uh, you know, there's companies that take uh, take opportunity for these things, and sometimes they're not beneficials to First Nations, you know, joint venture partners. But 
nevertheless, you know, we, we as part of a, and a muscle might wine, we did the original open pit. We did the portal decline and we did the whole camp and we built the airport. So, oh, and we built the uh, all season road that connects it. So it, it, it amounted to a substantial amount of money that uh, the G, JBPs uh, made out of it. Um, on the legislative side, nothing's really changed. Nothing really changed. I actually went to work for the provincial government because there was a gap that uh, on the legislative side that uh, that needed to be filled in order for First Nations to do their land use planning. And I don't take any credit for this, but but um, I say that uh, I helped. Uh, uh, I was a large part of uh, what they call the Far North Act that was uh, developed. Um, that was the legislative piece that we needed to enforce these land use plans. So that that went on for a while. The trouble is the uh, the the regional organization NAN Nishnabiaska Nation they opposed it without, with the exception of Wendigo First First Nations Council. And now fast forward uh, uh, Ford's uh, tractor. Uh, you know they're they're scrambling to, to to try and make changes to the Far North Act, and this is the same body that opposed it. So you got to go figure these things out. But long story short, it ended up uh, we ended up uh, having Cat Lake Slate Falls land use plan approved, and then the rest were just shelved pretty much. And now they're talking about rolling that part that piece over into the Public Lands Act, which is probably going to be a disaster. And uh, I think that's pretty much all I can say about that. Wow. Well, I, I appreciate you uh, sharing. And I'm going to shift the conversation over to Sonny um, and tell us how your relationship and your group's relationship has been with, um, with mining and the mining sector. Our relationship with our local mine here, uh, New Gold Mine, uh, it's basically uh, 15 miles north of us, uh, 25 kilometers or so, is about four years old. I come on uh, uh, to the community as uh, economic development, uh, uh, in economic development, and uh, I became involved then. I wasn't involved with the impact benefit agreement that was signed, that was negotiated, uh, uh, with our First Nation, I, I, I come in as we were getting involved with uh, the set-asides and uh, 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 the, the, the construction contracts that were part of the mine development. For us at Rainy River, it's been a, a learning curve in terms of how we lined up our corporation, how we lined up uh, partnerships. Uh, I think... Uh, uh, we've uh, learned uh, a tremendous uh, amount uh, concerning our own interests, concerning our uh, protecting our own interests and ensuring we, uh, we uh, achieve the most benefits. I think like uh, most uh, First Nations across the country, these mining uh, developments proceed on a template uh, type fashion with impact benefit agreements. Uh, for us at Rainy River, uh, we're uh, at least uh, myself personally uh, a little taken back by the uh, competitive nature uh, these uh, agreements have set out amongst us as First Nations. For uh, for me at Rainy River, we're known as the River People. At one time, we had seven communities along this river, 58 square miles that was amalgamated in 1913. And for us, uh, treaty is very important. So the collective interest uh, uh, in our view has to be our cornerstone when we look at our collective rights. And when uh, I, we, we started looking at opportunities and development, uh, uh, we realized uh, we're competing against our neighbors, our First Nation neighbors, and there's always winners and losers. And in fact, uh, uh, what resulted was a, a actually a diminishment of our authority, of our sovereignty, of our jurisdiction when we became almost uh, uh, competitive against each other for, uh, as you say, profit share agreements, uh, 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 commission type agreements where these uh, contractors come in 
and for the sake of a, 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 a JV or a partnership, they give you a percentage of their revenue. For me at Rainy River, I think it's uh, most important that we uh, reconsider uh, any uh, future development in terms of ownership uh, uh, as part of the business plan the mining sector comes forth with when they seek uh, senior debt financing. There's no reason why we shouldn't have been part of that equation when this happened. And uh, I think we have to uh, change the colonial mindset of development where they're not only giving us lip service with uh, 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 consultation consent mechanisms and basically virtually feeding us peanuts as opposed to the dollars they put in their banks after extracting, exploiting our resources. And I think that's the principal change we need to, uh, need to address as First Nations hopefully collectively, but I think uh, uh, down the road, we're, we have to change our business model. We have to change our business mindset when it comes to development in our territories. You know, uh, you're, you're taking the questions I wanna ask and you're, you're answering them uh, beautifully um, because one of the questions later on was what needs to change? And you mentioned the business mindset and for that, I want to turn a little bit towards MNP and to see how this relates to their business and how their business relates back to you. So um, I'm not sure who we'll, we'll start with Marcel. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. And thank you very much, Sonny. I appreciate it. Okay. So, so, so in my role as the, as a, what they call the recipient appointed advisor, uh, often the chief and counselors turn to me for other advice as well. So in the case of uh, if they're negotiating with a, a mining company in regards to an impact benefit agreement or revenue sharing of, of some sort, then they, uh, they turn to us and say, you know, can you help us with that, right? So we, uh, on the advisory side, and Terrell had mentioned that uh, earlier, is uh, we have a whole suite of business advisors that, that provide those services. So, um, you know, and, and, you know, I would be the quarterback in a situation like that. So I make sure that Cat Lake's interests are being, uh, are being served, that, uh, that they're getting the advice they need when sitting at the table with the mining uh, companies and uh, just making sure that at the end of the day, everybody's happy. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, and I have some some questions. Uh, Terrell, uh, do, do you want to let me know what <laughs> basically just you talk to me, you tell me I, I, I'm not uh, I'm not the yeah. expert. No, for sure. And we've also got Rob, I asked him to kind of join on too. Rob actually deals with a lot with our advisory services um, across the niche and across the landscape here. But from yeah. our side, Hi, I think Rob. we're just trying to from our side, we're, like, like what Marcel kind of mentioned there, we are basically trying to make sure that the interests of the First Nations are basically upheld there. Uh, Sonny had mentioned some of the agreements that happened before his time. And one thing that we kind of see from most of those agreements when we're looking back at them is that the promises and, and what the, maybe what um, Chief had mentioned, the percentage of employment and some of the revenue sharing factors that come into play, no one's really monitoring those from the mining side or from the First Nations side to make sure that the agreements are being upheld and in place there. That's one of the things that we kind of see when we come in after the fact on that side. Uh, if I could add something yeah. to that, uh, you know, uh, like all other IBAs, what we've noticed was employment uh, targets and we do monitor them for us and we make sure we're near the threshold that was outlined in our IBA. Uh, the one, uh, 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 circumstance we realize that happens with the mine, the corporate mine office, the senior executive, is that there really isn't any uh, validation of promises and commitments that are made for, at that level to operationalizing those commitments at the local level. And what I'm basically uh, uh, inferring that there is a culture, there is a culture of racism 
uh, that exists in local community. And that's existed since, uh, since our coexistence started at our, the signing of our treaty. And for me and for us as a community, it's always been a challenge to, uh, uh, to address uh, right from wrong on how our, uh, our employees that are working at, at the New Gold Mine, and as an example, their lines of progression and how they progress in comparison to non-natives. And again, uh, it it, it uh, uh, reflects back on the culture that exists, the local culture. And so uh, what we found uh, is that there needs to be more work uh, with corporate office and their local operations in terms of uh, uh, commitments and uh, set-asides, as an example. Are these being uh, administered properly? Is there... Uh, fair practices being done for a uh, fair opportunity. And for me, that's the rehaul that has to be done. And I think uh, if it can't be collectively as a universal standard or uh, a general rule, then I think it's up to us to develop that template and, and apply that uh, through our own, uh, 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 through our own efforts uh, uh, with leadership and with our technical capacity. I, I really think uh, some of us, uh, some of our First Nation uh, uh, neighbors have not uh, capitalized on these opportunities because they weren't prepared. And oftentimes it, it creates bad feelings amongst each other when we see benefits accruing to certain First Nations and not others. But uh, the, the primary uh, concern we have is the culture and uh, really giving effect to these good promises because sometimes it almost feels like it's lip service. Oh, well, thank you. And there's so many questions that are developing that I wanna to get to, but uh, first I wanna just hear from Rob. Right, thank you, Barrington. Hey, Sonny. Hey, hey so Rob. <laughs> How you guys doing? All right, go ahead and talk. I'm gonna have a smoke while you talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're gonna need what's like when I start talking. No, I don't wanna I don't wanna use up all the oxygen in the room there at Barrington. So I oh, just this is this to... is this is <laughs> MMP is a sponsor for mining over Canada. Like talk. This is all right. Well, yeah. I'll tell you what, I think I just wanna enforce or echo perhaps some of the comments that certainly my colleague Marcel and uh, and also that Terrell have, have made and, and to just touch on a bit of what Sonny and, and Russell I think uh, were mentioning as well. And I think there's a, there's a few things. First of all, from an MMP standpoint, you know, we have uh, very long standing relationships with our indigenous communities. They're extremely important and we want the best for them and we want them to succeed. So I think that's what brings us to the table. You know, certainly we have, um, you know, responsibilities. And as Marcel mentioned, you know, in his particular role with, uh, with Russell, um, you know, he's there to, to, to support, um, to ensure, to protect even to some extent, you know, some of the, uh, the community in, in certain affairs. And, and this is just part of, of what we're, you know, we're designed to do. I think that when we look historically into impact benefit agreements. I think much of what Sonny says, I'm, I'm wondering what the actual, you know, um, sentiment of, of some companies have been historically, you know, uh, what their true sort of agendas were relative to the Indigenous community. Having said that, you know, we found that historically there's a lot of impact benefit agreements, the historic ones, that were not being met or fulfilled. In fact, I was involved with a particular project where we had looked at about 22 uh, IBAs across the land. And of those 22, there were only a handful that today were enforced. So everyone had sort of um, um, moved away uh, or had, had forgotten, you know, the original agreements and their, their conditions and, and, and what was expected. And so it was, uh, you know, really, there, is no, there was limited benefit going to the Indigenous community. So I think there's better ways to do this. And I think we're entering into part of that discussion. We're not miners, you know, we're not construction, we're not lots of aspects of, 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 of mining, but what we are, 
are uh, people who are capable of understanding the agreements, understanding the conditions within those agreements, ensuring that someone's following those agreements. We're there to also look at numbers. We're there to look at things like is the appropriate return or revenue to the community, is, is it accurate? Is it real? Because we find sometimes as well that some of the communities, they may not have you know, uh, the necessary wherewithal to be able to monitor this as closely or be able to delve deeper into some of these kinds of, of things because they're complicated. They're complicated to all of us. And so I think our ability to keep things in check to act as a conduit between the mining community and, and the Indigenous community can certainly be there. We have a large duty to consult uh, activity that exists within our company. And uh, we are, we're very, we understand Indigenous rights very well. And I think we can bring to bear a, a good conversation and appropriate steps and meeting legislative obligations and things of that nature. So I think all of these things are important to make sure that People understand an agreement, people follow an agreement, that the obligations are being met, that the returns are just, and that the community is succeeding because, you know, it's important for the Indigenous world to succeed in these endeavors. It's important for the Indigenous world to be healthy and prosperous and to share what all Canadians accept as their daily reality because it's, it's not the case. Yeah. And the truth and Reconciliation Commission was very clear on many of these things, and we're a, we're certainly a big supporter of those uh, calls to action, and that's what brings us to the table. Sorry, Barrington. Yeah, no, Marcel. Like Marcel, go no, ahead. I just want to, and I, I'm just going to tip it off to to the chief here, but uh, a typical example, and we're, we're dealing with it right now, uh, and the chief will explain. Is uh, he he had mentioned uh, that there's a junior mining company in his backyard uh, who has uh, been you know, dan doing the dance with them for a while. Uh, but uh, even though that maybe they're documenting what their uh, their duty to consult, what it might entail, uh, you know, he's presented with uh, terms of reference for an environmental assessment that was done. And, and I'm going to turn it to you, Chief, but you had like, you had like weeks, if not weeks, just to assess that. And it was like a 60 page document. And all of a sudden, he's got to give an opinion, uh, you know, or, or give input into it, and and you know, without really consulting with his community. So, I'm just if you want to explain a little bit of how that happens, and and it's it's it, I think it happens more than 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 it shouldn't happen. Uh, certainly, is that we they need to be uh, consulting with the communities uh, in the traditional territories that they uh, that they are uh, mining in. Or, requesting to mine yeah yeah we uh, we, we we did have a, certainly the experience with uh, with this junior mining company that wants to develop a property that's uh, that's uh, right under a lake uh, it's really quite an interesting project because of the, the, the potentially the impacts the environmental impacts that the project would have over the 10-year uh, lifespan of the lifespan of the mine, the potential mine. So, so this particular junior company, uh, um, uh, what I assume, I don't, I don't really want to read into things, but uh, you know, the the the, uh, the current government uh, announced an omnibus bill, and embedded in there was a certain little legislative piece around the environmental assessment. So, essentially, affords. Uh, Tractor, so to speak. So this this junior decided to jump on that, and they accelerated their posting of their terms of reference to the EBR. Uh, you know, so we looked at it, and there was a deadline of October five, I believe it was. Uh, and uh, we looked at it, and then I I spoke to the, uh, the the junior, the junior mining company, and uh, you know, I think a lot of the issues around duty con to consult or um, misinterpreted or not understood properly by, by juniors or mining companies for that matter. Uh, when I talked to him, I initially talked to, the, to this person about capacity funding, their offer was $7,500. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, 
I, I, I literally had to laugh at that because, you know, what that tells me is that, you know, this mining company is so, <laughs> so out of touch with uh, reality that, you know, I, I just had to laugh at him. Okay. So, what is, what is, and again, our audience is like me. I don't know 7,500. What? Like how? $7,500 uh, was uh, to, to talk about capacity building. Uh, to, to build a relationship between the junior and the, and the uh, mining company. Oh. <laughs> we wanted to fund a portion of that uh, for consultation reasons. Oh, my God. Okay. I, I just ba basically laughed at him. I said, you know, the, you have no idea how much actual consultation with the various components is actually going to cost. So when I did this review, I did, I, I did do the review of the... Uh, the terms of reference that's posted on the EVR. And uh, the, the initial costs just for the review itself is around $45,000. So, but on a lighter note, the, the, the company has agreed to, to pay for that cost. So I guess that's a positive in a way, but if, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that they're really out of touch with what's required. The other thing too, is I found is that, and I'm kind of leaning towards uh, 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 collusion between the, the province and the juniors and the mining industry for that matter, has been the involvement of the uh, particular ministry. And twice I've had to warn the ministry representative that uh, that's not appropriate for you to be involved at that level. This is the relationship between the First Nation and, and, and the junior mining company. And right. we're along just fine on the, on the uh, uh, struggling with the word, um, Uh, negotiations, uh, the yeah, yeah, you know, charting which steps we're going to take. So uh -huh. we're doing just fine with the mining company, and kind of like we're both in the learning environment. But uh, I hate to say this, but I have more experience than all the guys combined in that junior mining company. So I like to say I know what I'm talking about. And on top of that, I have a team of uh, experts that help me all along the way. You know. So we, we, we do know what we're doing, you know, you know, we have different First Nations that we uh, bounce ideas off and we, we actually do communicate with each other, and, you know, different First Nations uh, across the region on similar issues. So, but anyways, that's my, that was my experience with, with, uh, with this junior and, and, and their interpretation of a duty to consult and how they're going to go about it. And, it's, and they're nowhere near where we need to be. See, this is the this is the type of, of things that we want to know and learn about and know that it happens and it currently happens and it's happened in the past and it's continuing to and it needs to get better. My 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 immediate question when things aren't followed through on, when agreements aren't matched, what's the recourse? Like if if a company isn't doing or meeting or fulfilling their obligations with what they discussed. Um, with your community, with your group, what's the recourse? What happens? Unfortunately, once you have a, a, an agreement, there is, really isn't much you can do other than physically going to the, to the, uh, the, the site and shutting it down. Um, and, you know, all the legislative requirements have been met uh, as part of that uh, uh, that project, uh, everything from uh, uh, the, the, the PEA to the, the construction phase and then, and then through the operations, all the legislative requirements uh, have been met. And once the agreement has been signed, uh, it allows that company to proceed. And typically once that happens, there's, there's really not too much you can do uh, unless you have a legally binding uh, agreements in these in these uh, agreements that say that define review periods, and then that's all you, you really have. But but if you have a really significant issue where where you needed to shut the mine down, there really is nothing in place other than violence. So, and, and that's the reality. Just, <laughs> it just seems like it should not be that. Um, yeah. Oh. 
I found generally though that mining agreements, such as a Placer Dome, Goa, Gold Corp, Newmont, they, they've honored their agreements. Like in the muscle oil agreement, it's been reviewed a number of times and it's currently going through another review process. And I, I think the last time it was ever reviewed quite a, quite a while ago, I don't think there was any substantial changes other than a, a retaining the Canadian versus US dollar amount. And that was it. Um, there hasn't really been much change. The, the, the deployment uh, targets are still the same. The revenue sharing formulas are still the same. Um, and the relationship is going on. And, and, I, and I have to say the relationship between the parties and, and the new month is, is, is good. Oh, Typ good. A, yeah, typically you'll have a, a, a rug um, mine manager come in that upsets everything. But, you know, any company does that to, to you know, have, have that continuity of relationships. Uh, even government does that. They change their staff all, around all the time. Um, I had a, I had a question and this might come out as ignorant, but <clears throat> say you agree on a certain price, um, and that price of whatever commodity, we'll just say gold, uh, cause that's, that's an easy example. The price goes up significantly, but you agreed on a, on a price say four years ago or eight years ago. How does that work? Do you see the change in the rise with the prices? Will some companies just try and keep it at that certain price, what was agreed to years ago? Um, yeah, how do, how would that work? No, there there would be a, there would be a calculations uh, built right into the agreement um, based on the time and the price of gold, things like that. So 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 it would increase periodically. That, that's why you have review periods during during the lifespan of the mining agreement. Uh, so, so there are mechanisms in place where where you get to revisit the uh, uh, the revenue sharing formula, but rarely does it change very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, another question. Uh, what if there's a what if? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go sorry, ahead. Barrington, and yeah, yeah. Please jump in there with with Russell. I think that. The notion that there are fluctuating numbers and to reflect on what I was mentioning earlier, you know, the ability to stay on top of those numbers and to ensure that you are getting the return from the agreement is challenging, which again speaks to having, you know, certain supports in that regard. And so one of the things we found in a couple of, in some cases, is that not only does that number it may not necessarily reflect what it should because of the fluctuation in prices of the commodity. But in another way, sometimes the company is reporting certain things. Um, let's see how best to put this, how they're pro proportioning their monies on the project and where monies are going and so forth is not necessarily um, um, the right way to do that because it's giving a, a, false, a false number at the end of the day. So let me use an example. Sometimes we look at uh, you know, contracting efforts and if the other, if the partner or if somebody else is involved, they may consume revenue and put it into other aspects of the business. So at the end of the day, it only looks like a certain return is being, being generated but in reality, they've actually absorbed a bunch of that revenue in other aspects of their of the business, and so it's not it's not fairly being represented. So there's a lot of things that can occur that can be very challenging. All of that, and when you have large mining interests and a small indigenous community, the expectation that these two things are equal when it comes to that is erroneous. Is wrong. Just another point to that. Uh, yeah. What I'd like to uh, yeah. uh, to add into that is the uh, you know the matter of uh, uh, enforcement compliance and uh, really appreciating the fact that there has to be a capacity uh, developed internally to each first nation to uh, count the beans, so to speak. Uh, there is a. Uh, uh, commitments that have been made financially. And we, we all have our experiences with contractors and chargebacks and chargeovers and change orders. 
and it's very important that we analyze these uh, uh, this documentation to ensure we're getting a fair Matthew, shake. Line one, Matthew, line one. One of the one of the things that uh, is certainly missing uh, from uh, the First Nations side is ensuring the responsibility of government, whether it's uh, the provincial government in Ontario or the federal government, and ensuring that they uh, fulfill their fiduciary duty to uh, protect uh, our treaty rights as we uh, understand them uh, as, as nations. And I don't know if we've held them accountable to that point where their only engagement was uh, enabling this, uh, this development to occur and they step back and at strategic points, they, uh, they add something to the file in terms of a report and they let industry carry on with its exploitation. And for me, that's the, the, the need for a comprehensive agreement when it comes to mining and a relationship, uh, whether it's individually with nations or collectively with, with treaty, uh, treaty territory. And for some reason, the colonial nature of how we're set up with our First Nation regime, uh, the Assembly First Nation, our political organizations, our tribal organizations has fra fa uh, fragmented us in terms of each of our jurisdictions competing against each other. And, and until we can come to grips with that and get that organized, we are gonna be at the mercy and we, not, we are not exercising our Right, our right to consent, and for uh, until that's organized, uh, we are not going to see much change except uh, 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 internally to to my community and with my friends and my uh, my leadership. I call them bitch agreements. You know, we sign uh, 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 token agreements for uh, pennies on a dollar revenue share when we should actually be investors and owners of these resources that extract it, that resource. And if our people uh, consented to that and we have that to back us up, then I think that only strengthens our resolve as nations as opposed to communities. I, I think the, the days of uh, uh, the colonial plan from the early 1900s, 1800s have got to be changed. And uh, we have to uh, 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 change our attitude uh, about uh, being pawns of a system, a legislative system that uh, uh, basically contains our growth, our development. You, you talk a lot about your neighbors and the, the communication, and I'm assuming you're in touch frequently with them. How do they feel? Do they agree with you about this? Um, yeah, like wh why, what's, what's, and this could just be an ignorant question, but what is stopping you from talking with your neighbor and the two groups saying, okay, I might be getting a little more, you might be getting a little less. Why don't we just put it together and, you know, sort of strengthen numbers? I think the point I was alluding to was the, the, the situation we find ourselves in today. Uh, we have competing IBAs. With, oh, uh, I see. Okay, specific we're... set asides for each community, yeah. and some of them become uh, competitive in nature, uh, all for one, but only one for one, and that's the nature that's been created. We've been divided. There is no comprehensive agreement. There are individual IBAs that have been established and that have been supported and condoned by the by the the crown regimes, the provincial governments and the federal government. So. For me, I think the fiduciary has been uh, has been lacking in this regard, and it, it for me it's up to our leadership to address this and to get ourselves organized for because the next time around, you know, we can ensure we're 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 in fact owners, we're investors, and we will be getting uh, uh, you know uh, uh, appropriate uh, uh, return on on dollars that we can invest. You know, the crown uh, the crown in terms of our trust dollars cannot pay us back so it would it, you know I don't think it's a, a, a challenging feat to uh, get a, a, a guarantee of investment for whatever uh, partnership share we want with a mining company or mining companies 
and for me, uh, uh, holding them to that uh, to that uh, condition is something that we need to do as First Nations people. And I don't see that being uh, uh, what's the word promoted uh, 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 amongst our leadership. We're still uh, working independent in an isolation of each other. Um, does does the type of government? The type of federal government that's that's in power impact or change uh, over the years, whether it's progress or sorry, um, the progressive conservatives, liberal, NDP, does it matter? Have you seen benefits more one way or less the other? I've seen lip service from all uh, uh, party colors, whether they're NDP, liberal, or conservative. They have a mandate uh, to develop uh, uh, a colonial type regime amongst our territories, and that hasn't changed. You know, we're all uh, victims or uh, victims of, of land acquisition, where we've lost our lands, we've lost our right to the lands uh, through legislation that was uh, basically conspired by Canada and Great Britain. So we have that experience in hand. I think what's needed is to really organize ourselves effectively with technical resources uh, in a financial context, but in a legal context too that ensures our development as true owners, as true uh, 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 stakeholders will happen. We cannot be part of the pie as an, an ingredient, as an ingredient, we have to be the cook. And I haven't seen that, uh, that demonstrated. To I'm going to use that line, by the way, when I, record that i'm going to use that as one of the show line uh show notes because that's really really important oh. um mnp um going forward with your experience and what you've observed and what you've worked on what are some of the changes that's needed and i don't know if you're able to answer this what are some of the changes that you've observed that needs to happen within the indigenous communities? And then what are some of the changes that needs to happen with the mining companies? Now, um, I guess just a couple, one, one quick uh, thought, you know, I, I guess I just hope that as, you know, I referenced the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and I guess as I think about the future in general, you know, I guess I, I hope that any major interest that finds its way onto our lands, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm the National Director of Indigenous Services for MNP in one hat, but in another hat, I'm from the Norway House Cree Nation and a proud member of Kinoseo Sipi. And I guess I believe that people need to have more progressive thoughts going forward. And again, I echo the comment I made. We all should want prosperity for one another. We should all want help, and we should all want, um, you know, wealth, and we should all want good things. And if more resource extractors can approach this subject to both A, satisfy their needs for developing and be, be gracious and compassionate and, and work with indigenous communities with a, with a, with a full heart and a, and a real, you know, belief in, in working and partnering together, then great things will happen. And so that's what I think mining companies have to not see indigenous peoples as obstacles. They should see them as troop partners and be able to work with them because both parties, I think, are trying to achieve something that collectively they can get to if, they're, if it's done right. So that's one thing. And on the indigenous community side, one of the things that would be helpful, I believe, is just for more communities to perhaps understand development in this regard, and perhaps to even start to see it maybe as a subject in, in a school system, maybe for the community as a whole, so that they also have a greater appreciation. Because sometimes the notion is, hey, a mine's coming, I think it'll open up tomorrow, when in fact a mines company, it's probably gonna be 15 years from now before it opens its doors. And to understand some of the elements of what's all involved. So I think that would be helpful as well. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that. 
another uh, vital element that we need to address as First Nations is the corporate structure and the corporate interface will uh, will employ with mining industry and government as it relates to resource uh, development. Oftentimes, uh, we're uh, uh, without capacity to uh, uh, engage in a financial negotiations. We're uh, not uh, 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 ready to negotiate uh, uh, impact benefit agreements. And for, for me, until we start explaining and give, providing that orientation to our community, uh, our direction is actually being uh, 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 channeled in a vacuum type uh, manner that we aren't uh, uh, consulting our own as opposed to uh, engaging it with the engagement of industry. For me, uh, 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 what we need to do is improve our communication. I think government uh, has uh, clearly understood they've, they've dismantled our governance systems by creating uh, funding regimes for national provincial offices, tribal offices, supposedly to represent the community interest and with the understanding that they're consulting. A lot of these negotiations uh, 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 take uh, the form of, of, of months and that ability to negotiate with a consultation mechanism, with a, a consent mechanism uh, fails to materialize. And what we fail to, uh, I believe what we haven't uh, uh, identified and developed amongst ourselves is conditions, conditions for trust, conditions for consultation, conditions for consent. Uh, it, rather than being owners and proprietors of this development, we're commodities and we're just a cost of doing business rather than being part owner of the business. And I feel that's the biggest uh, 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 issue that's confronting us as First Nations, that we have to uh, uh, look at the global interests in terms of future generations. Uh, thank you, thank you, Sonny. I, I appreciate that and uh, yeah, we share we deeply share your your concern, um, Terrell. What what do you think? Um, certain or all? Just what's your experience? What do you think could change um, from the people you work with, the people you work for, where it's headed? Well, I think a big part of it, Sunny, and and also Rob kind of touched on it, is like the communication and collaboration between both the First Nations and the mining companies. Uh, one situation I know Sonny and I dealt with, it wasn't with the mining community or uh, company, uh, in fact, but it's other organizations and industry that are in there, but it can definitely relate to mining, um, is just the sharing of information. So where the relationships kind of end that we see along the ways is um, where Sonny alluded to too, is trust. Um, if the mining companies and the First Nations aren't trusting in the information that they're sharing and that they're being transparent with each other, uh, those relationships become pretty sour and end pretty quickly that standpoint so that's one thing that we're seeing a lot of it is the transparency of information and the sharing of it oh thank you uh marcel what have you seen well you know i i uh, i'm going to echo what rob had mentioned too uh he talked about uh and it's not just mining companies we'll just talk about any partnerships that communities are looking at uh fostering with with construction companies with you know uh, trucking companies whatever um you know they they should be looked at as partners so being a partnership as opposed to a, a um rob put it as a as a hurdle uh many cases i think mining companies come in uh, expecting to do what they want to do without really consulting with uh, the communities and and you know like I, I think the general public does not really understand uh, what, when we talk about traditional territory, when the communities talk about traditional territories, um, they, the, the communities themselves, you know, they might have a, a, a land base uh, reserve of say five square miles or something, but their hunting and trapping and traditional territories extends for hundreds of miles around their communities. And they've been, they've been living on those lands for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, 
and you know, uh, and Russell could speak to this. He knows the type of, uh, you know, the caribou, uh, you know, the, the moose population, the, you know, the, the fishing population of, of all these, you know, within a hundred hundreds of miles of, of their community, they, they are very familiar with, with what's going on in, in their territory. And so just for a junior mining company to, to, to drop into a middle of nowhere, uh, the, you know, these are areas where, where these people live. You know, it's not just their reserve. It's, it's well, that's so what when when uh, when Chief Russell was talking about, <laughs> they wanted to mine under the lake. Well, that will affect fishing. That will affect uh, the animals that that use. Like it just goes on and on and on and on. Of and for what? Like, I I don't know. I I don't I don't have the answer. But um, but yeah, thank you. Um, Chief, what do you, what needs to change? What needs to change like now? And that's a, that's, that's a tough question. Like, uh, you know, the, the way, uh, the way everything is now, the, you know, the, the, the government structure, the provincial side, uh, the feds are really not in it. Uh, and then on the first nation side, you have uh, all, all sorts of uh, issues. Uh, you know, the, you have a, uh, uh, land issues, uh, you have treaty issues, uh, and all of those things uh, uh, encourage the parties to talk to each other. But they, but they don't always go as planned because you know you, you have, well you know there's different people involved on the industrial side. Uh, their ultimate goal is to 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 make money. Whereas the whereas on the First Nations side, their ultimate responsibility as stewards of the land is to Protect the land, uh, primarily in, in, the, in the protection of water. So you know you have these clash clash of uh, needs and uh, uh, you know that always contribute to the the, the, the media news. Uh, the, the the things that are in the news is these clashes is because you know First Nations people have their first responsibilities to to protect the the land and they were governed by certain uh, roles and responsibilities uh, when it comes to protecting that land you know um, that's why we have uh, uh, that you know you know certain families are responsible for a certain area of land and then in turn these these people are, are are members of a community and then that community represents that territory so so in in Cat Lake's case, uh, um, uh, you know, this documented right in the treaty number nine that we're not part of this treaty. So so in in this case, uh, you know, there's there's the possible position that Cat Lake has Aboriginal title over 1.3 million hectares of land, and and those types of things generate the the, the prevailing environment that we're in. And, and oftentimes mining companies don't understand that. And um, uh, and then there's the, the, the long-term vision of the community. Well, how are we gonna sustain ourselves? How are we gonna sustain our economy? So there's, uh, they're always caught in the, in, the, in, in the spot between protecting the land and advancing their, their economic future. So it's, it's a tough situation to be in. And government doesn't help it because uh, you know they're they're trying to uh, trying to generate tax revenues themselves. So it always creates a, an environment of uh, and, and the ones that pay the ultimate price for this is uh, uh, the First Nations people, because uh, in the view of the the governments uh, we 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 signed away the land, and that's ultimately what it boils down to is the perception that we gave away our lands and in fact we didn't. So uh, that's just a bit of a, a more, more relaxed uh, view of uh, treaties and how it impacts uh, industry. Well, I want to, I want to say on behalf of the Canadian Securities Exchange on behalf of Mining Over Canada, our sponsors, uh, MMP, Odyssey, Gowlings, um, 
yeah, this has been the most impo- impactful conversation I've had. I like to have conversations that matter. And this, this is one of them. And thank you. Thank you to our guests. Um, thank you, Sonny. Thank you, Russell. Um, thank you, MMP, Marcel, Taro. Uh, one more point. I've got to say one more point. Oh, yeah. yeah of course. <laughs> hey. <laughs> You asked the question, what needs to happen? Uh, I think uh, uh, today and tomorrow going forward, there's a real need for strategic planning. There's a real need for a comprehensive plan to be developed for the affected uh, region of development. I think we've uh, allowed and accepted this competitive uh, 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 system of impact benefit agreements between First Nation collectives. And historically, we've always uh, uh, come together in times of opportunity or in times of crisis. And for that reason, we've actually uh, become uh, uh, adversaries to neighbor First Nations with this IBA process. And that has to change. There has to be collective conditions uh, uh, of, of, of trust, of consultation, of development that we can uh, 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 adopt as individual First Nations, but more so collectively as First Nations. Our strength doesn't come from each other. That's what uh, the colonial system did to us. It divided us and it separated us and put us on separate pieces of land and making us almost selfish, believing that's our only entity when in Treaty 3, we have 58,000 square miles on this community were 58 square miles. And that's the economic power we have with, along with our projects and along with our land base we own in this district. And that's some of the clout. And yet our own neighbors, our own neighbors, uh, our municipal neighbors uh, in this area don't know our clout. They don't know we have businesses that employ the majority of non-natives who come work for us. They don't know we own lands, we're paying fee simple taxes on those lands. So they don't understand that because we've been kept in isolation of general society. And yet you don't know, uh, and Canada doesn't know how this relationship was affected, how it was impacted by government policy, by government uh, development. And that's the change that has to happen. There has to be a cooperative approach to this. We can't be left on the sidelines while development uh, occurs. And for me, I think until, unless we come to a, a resolve with that, a remedy to that, we, we are going to have some conflict down the road as our young people become more educated and more familiar with uh, the lost opportunity. So th- that's my, uh, uh, my comment. And you would have gave me a couple more days uh, to prepare. I would have had a little bit longer speech like Rob did. <laughs> well, <laughs> Nobody um, can talk on. like Rob. I got to yeah, get the no. last word in. No. <laughs> I, I got to run, guys. It's so good to see you, Russell. Sonny, I uh, can't say the same for Marcel and Terrell. But good seeing you, Fair fellas. Peace out, my brothers. All right. Thank you. Okay. Here uh, you know what? This is this is the start of, of something like this, is education, is getting the story out, is getting it across, across Canada. Um, That's what Mining Canada is doing. And that's why we want to have these interviews. I don't want this to be a one-off. I'd like to do this again with, obviously with your permission and with more, uh, more timing. Um, Yeah, this will be, (laughs) these are great conversations to have and really, really important. Well, can you do me a favor as you uh, prepare your uh, edit on your film? You do a photo op. You make me look like a movie star, okay? <laughs> oh, well, you already do. So I don't have to do anything. Come on. <laughs> well, oh, yeah. It was fun. Well, thank you. And uh, as I said earlier, on behalf of the Canadian Securities Exchange and Mining Over Canada, I'd like to just say thank you, and we appreciate it. Uh, I've been your host, Barry to Miller, and this week we travel to Ontario.